Okay, well, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. And you're joining us on our third webinar of a four part series. My name is Emily Springer, and I'm an academic trainer in the Center for Teaching and Learning. I am very uh, grateful to have Dr. Linda Bluford join us today for her webinar entitled Everyday Ethics in Qualitative Research. As always, we encourage conversation in the chat and any questions in the Q&A. Um, in an effort to not lose any of your questions, please do pop them in the Q&A function of your Zoom. Brief reminder that this webinar is being recorded. And if you would like to see the scrolling subtitles of this webinar, please feel free to hover over the bottom of your Zoom, hit the CC option and select show subtitle. So great to see everyone popping in the chat where you're joining us from, or grateful to have you all joining us today. And without any further ado, I am going to pass this over to Dr. Linda Bloomberg. Thanks so much, Emily. Thank you to you and the CTL for hosting these webinars, which I know are really valuable to our students, especially our dissertation students and those who are entering, still yet to enter the dissertation phase. So I'm always really happy to present and to be a part of this um, initiative. I am going to, after I've just explained my process, I'm going to turn my camera off so that I have better bandwidth and that we don't lose any connections here. And we're going to focus on the PowerPoint that I've prepared. But I just do want to say, and as I always say with all of my webinars, um, this is really an, uh, a very interactive approach that I adopt with these webinars. Um, I welcome all sorts of questions and discussion, and I will be stopping along the way to take some questions and then again at the end. So when I do stop along the way, I'm going to ask Emily what kind of questions or what questions, if at all, have popped up in the chat, and I'll address those, and then we'll move on. So get your questions ready as you move forward. You don't have to keep them until the end, and I really look forward to learning with and from all of you in this session. So that said, I'm going to take myself off camera, and we're going to move forward. Um, this webinar is really one that I'm really looking forward to presenting because a lot has changed and keeps on evolving in the world of ethics, research ethics, especially since COVID. A lot has come about that we need to be much more attentive to and much more mindful of. So we're going to be talking about all of these things um, in today's discussion. Uh, to begin, I just want to make clear that ethics and rigorous research are really two sides of the same coin, and they're mutually independent, interdependent. So in other words, rigorous research means ethical research, and ethical research means doing rigorous research. You cannot have one without the other. Ethics is concerned with the shared principles that qualitative researchers must uphold to guide all of our interactions with our research participants. Ethics very broadly addresses the protection of human participants in research, including issues of confidentiality, privacy, anonymity, advocacy, and human dignity. And really, qualitative research is about sharing, respecting, and most importantly, authentically and ethically representing diverse voices. And I'd like you to just keep that statement in the back of your mind as we move forward today, because that really is what it's all about. How do we in qualitative research authentically and ethically represent the diverse voices of our research participants who are generously giving of their time and experiences to participate in our research? And remember, the point of qualitative research is to explore a phenomenon by better understanding the experiences of others. So we really have to ethically and responsibly understand those experiences and portray those experiences in a very ethical way. What are some of the concerns about ethics? Um, first, the traditional ethical safeguards of anonymity, confidentiality, and consent are only a starting point. It's also really critical that researchers recognize that qualitative research requires ongoing consent discussions and employing ongoing safety plans. So it's not just like a once-off. It's not like you say, okay, I've done it. I've addressed confidentiality. I'm addressing anonymity. I'm done. I can move forward. You have to be keep, you have to keep on thinking about ethics at every single step of the way. And you're going to see through this webinar what I mean by that and how important that really is. Because when you write a well-articulated proposal, 
you have not yet really anticipated all of the ethical issues that can arise. So you need to be prepared to respond appropriately throughout the research process. And it's critical to indicate in your dissertation how and when you have actually addressed all relevant ethical issues. So we want to, as much as possible, avoid what is called the black box approach in research, where you just say, I adopted an ethical approach. That, that doesn't really do justice to what you really have to do. You have to explain step by step in detail what you've actually done so that readers of your study get the full picture and can really accept that you have adopted an ethical approach. So remember that black box approach is something you really want to avoid because if you do adopt such an approach, either with data collection or data analysis or ethics, there are going to be questions throughout and especially by your committee in the defense as to how you actually conducted the analysis or how you actually safeguarded anonymity or confidentiality, et cetera. So remember, you have to be very, very, very clear in your explanations and very detail oriented. Some of the core ethical considerations are that ethics addresses the protection of human participants, including, as I said previously, confidentiality, privacy, anonymity, advocacy, and human dignity. Ethical principles shape our research approach, including the type of research questions we ask, our choice of research sites, the kind of people that we choose to participate in our research, and the kind of stories that we choose to share and those that we choose not to tell. That's really important as well. Like, why are we as researchers choosing to tell some stories and not tell others? And that's, again, something to keep in the back of your mind at all times. Like, am I being ethical? Am I including all voices, even those that don't match up to what I believe in, what I assume, or what I have preconceived ideas about. Sometimes we hear stories that don't fully meet with our own perspectives and we cannot discard those stories no matter what. So the implications of the choices we make beyond basic methodological decisions are indeed more critical today than ever before. And you'll see why in this presentation. So I would also like to just go over the learning objectives for today's webinar, which is to provide you with the guidelines and clarification regarding all aspects that characterize ethical practices in dissertation research and specifically qualitative research. We're gonna define ethics as it relates to qualitative research. We're gonna delve into the three core principles of the Belmont Report, which are respect, beneficence, and justice. We're going to look at what is implied by conducting research with vulnerable populations or groups. We're going to address researcher power and positionality. And I'm also going to present an overview of the challenges and concerns regarding research ethics that have emerged, especially since the onset of the pandemic. So that said, I'm going to stop for a moment before we define ethics. And I'm just going to take any questions that may have arise, that may have arisen in these first few introductory moments. Emily, is there anything that anyone has to ask? I'm going to wait just a second to see if anything populates. Um, but just as a, a reminder, uh, questions in the Q&A, conversation in the chat, we did have a few folks um, join us after the top of the hour. And this webinar is slotted for a one hour time frame today, just so you are aware. I didn't see anything else pop up, so I'm going to pause there. Dr. Okay, Robert. we'll we'll continue and remember any questions that you have, just put them out there and we'll stop again a little later. So let's define ethics. The word ethics comes from the Greek word ethos, which means character. Ethics involves morality, integrity, fairness, and truthfulness. Morality is about knowing what is right and wrong, and integrity is about acting on that knowledge. So ethics is, the, is of the utmost importance so that our research is not harmful to humans in any way, whether it's individuals, groups, or communities. So how do we start planning to do our work in the most ethically responsible way? Let's go back to one of the most important documents that exists today regarding ethics, uh, which is the Belmont Report, written in 1979, and this came about following a number of national and international conventions regarding the conduct of ethical research. Um, the National Commission for the, Protection of, for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research produced the Belmont Report. And the three principles of this report, which have become the three pillars of research ethics, 
were later, were later operationalized in 2018 into the detailed rules and procedures that make up what's called the common rule, which governs research at all United States universities and many other universities in other countries as well. In accordance with the Belmont report, a researcher is mandated to adhere to the three basic ethical principles for human subjects, which are respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. Let's look at each one of these individually um, in turn. First is respect for persons. Participants in a research study must be treated as autonomous agents who are capable of making informed decisions concerning whether or not to participate in the study and to whether or not to, to, to stay within the study even after they've consented to participate. In addition to being capable and informed, all participants must be free of coercion or undue influence. That word undue influence actually comes out of the Belmont report and there's a lot written about it. And if you want more information on it, you should read up on it because it really is very important. Persons with diminished autonomy are entitled to protection. And we're gonna look a little further at who are those people that are considered to have diminished autonomy. These are basically what we call vulnerable populations. And we're gonna look at that in a little bit more depth a little later on. The second principle of the Belmont Report is beneficence, where all persons must be treated in an ethical manner, not only by respecting their decisions and protecting them from harm, but also by making efforts to secure their well-being throughout the entire study and before the study and after the study. So remember, when your study ends, you cannot walk away and think that your work is done. We have to consider as well what may come about as a result of our research and the findings and what we can do to um, mitigate any harm that may come um, along um, to, you know, to both individuals, groups, and communities. The third principle is called justice. And justice refers to the fair and equitable treatment of individuals and groups who are selected to participate in your study. And this is applied to ensure equality in the selection of potential research participants. And injustice occurs when some people will benefit um, and some people will be denied or withheld for whatever reason. And in this case, a burden is unduly imposed on them. So remember, justice is about fair and equitable treatment, both in selection and the ongoing participation in the research. So as outlined in the Belmont Report, the means that are used to recognize these three core principles are informed consent, risk benefit analysis, and appropriate selection of research participants. And just before I go into these, because they're quite detailed, I'm gonna stop for a moment. If anybody has a question about um, the three principles, which are respect, beneficence, and justice. So while we wait to see if anyone has questions on respect, benefits, and justice, um, I do have a, a question in the q and I'd like to ask, is there a difference between ethics prioritizing human protection and ethics which prioritiz prioritize ideas, social movements, information, or other entities such as AIs? Well, remember, all of those other um, entities are come back to individuals. So we have to be really cognizant of protecting individuals and groups and communities' safety. So it's not just single individuals, not just single human research participants. It's the groups that people belong to, whether it's social media groups or actual groups, physical groups, or their entire community. So it's much broader than just single individuals it really, um, we should see it as, you know, starting with people, but extending to those people's groups and communities and even society at large. And social media definitely plays into this as groups as well. So I hope I've answered that. And it's a really good question. Uh, thank you for that question. And let us know if we can expand on that a little bit. Um, Alan has a question about the Belmont report. Do you know if there's a link Yes, there absolutely is a link, and I'm not going to pop it into the Q and A now okay. because I may lose connection. Okay. But I will actually add it to this presentation on a slide that I start talking about the Belmont report over here. I'll add it to this, and when Emily sends out or posts this um, presentation, it will be there. 
There so. is definitely. You just go to www.belmontreport.com and it'll pop up. But I'll add it to this as well. In fact, I was thinking about it as I was going through this so that someone read my mind that I should have added it to that slide. Thank you so much, Alan, for that. And we will get that to you um, as a follow-up after this webinar. Thank you. Okay, great. Anything else or no? That's it for now. Okay, great. So let's start looking at these three um, core principles, starting with informed consent. So informed consent is actually referred to assent in research that involves minors, that is human beings that are under the age of 18. And this is the term, either consent or assent, is the, are the terms given to the agreement between the researcher and the participant. Any interaction between researchers and participants that yields data, whether structured or formal or unstructured and conversational, should be preceded through a so, should, sorry, should be preceded by a thorough explanation of the research. In other words, we really need to let our participants know ahead of time what is the purpose of this research. We do not keep this a secret. We do not ever try and fool people or lead them um, astray. We have to be very upfront and honest about why we are conducting research. What is the actual purpose of this research? And if you look at your research purpose statement, that really should explain it. Informed consent also includes all the associated expectations and written or verbal affirmation of consent. In other words, we do have to have signed consent forms. And the researcher is expected to discuss the information in the informed consent letter and make sure that participants fully understand that the information will be treated as confidential. This is one of the number one priorities that has to be stated in a consent letter, that your information, we're telling this to participants, your information will remain confidential. And we do this, and you'll see in the webinar, by using pseudonyms, by never disclosing anybody's name or ad any identifying information about them, where they work, where they study, how old they are, um, anything about them. We don't use any of that personal identifying information at all in our research. In fact, we use pseudonyms for humans, and we also use a pseudonym for the research site. It's very, very unusual that in a dissertation, you'll give the exact name of the school you're, start, you're, you're doing your research at or the organization. Usually we use a pseudonym because remember, if you disclose the name of the site, then the, the people who are participating could be compromised because the, the readers of the study will know what the site was, what the name of the school was or the name of the organization. And then even though we use pseudonyms for the participants, that may be a very small organization. And in that case, it may be easy to sort of detect or work out who the people are. So we don't want to put any of our human research participants at risk in any way at all. So that is informed consent. And I'm going to stop there for a moment if there's any question about that. Uh, just a moment here. Can you, what I think some things may um, percolate in about informed consent, but can you explain risk slash benefit analysis? Well, we're going to get to that in a moment. Okay. That's Great. the next one. Yeah. Great. So if there's nothing about informed consent, then we'll move forward. And no, that is um, exactly what's just been asked. It's the risk benefit analysis. Great. So the risk benefit analysis implies the researcher's responsibility to minimize all potential risks and maximize the potential benefits associated with the study. Remember, we don't want our research participants in any way to be put at risk. In fact, we want them to have benefits from participating. And sometimes there's no financial remuneration, but there are benefits in terms of people being able to share their voices, share their experiences, have their experiences known. So those are some of the potential benefits that come with a study. And because people are voluntarily participating, this implies that they want to share experiences. So nobody should ever be coerced to participate in a study. And that is why we don't consider st study. We don't do studies with people that we know or people that we work with, because in those cases, people may feel compelled to say what they think the researcher wants to hear. And that is not what research is about. That goes against ethical research. So we want people to freely participate and feel very free and comfortable in sharing what they have to say. Emily, is there anything? Yes, a couple of things just popped up. Um, when you're sampling a larger population, how do you ensure that confidentiality piece? Well, the size of the population or the size of a sample should make no difference. Every single person that participates in a study, and remember in qualitative research, we have 
smaller samples. We don't have random samples. So we have purposefully selected smaller samples and every single person that participates has to sign a consent form and be fully informed as to what the study is about. And I, I'm gonna wait until a little bit more pops up with risk and benefit. There's another question about um, where you can pull um, your research um, from. So for example, is it okay to identify regional areas as opposed to specific areas? Yeah, you could say you're doing research in the state of Georgia, for instance. Okay. But you could even say you're doing research in the city of Atlanta in the state of Georgia, but then you wouldn't go and name the school. You wouldn't go and name the, the organization because that's getting too specific. Okay. All right, thank the you regional, so much. regional um, location is okay. You can say, some people say just in the Southeast or, you know, in one state in the South. Some people don't even go as far as to say the name of the specific state. And every, if every, in every decision that you make and what you're going to write, you have to, re you have to say to yourself, what's the risk? What's the benefit of putting this down on paper, basically? So ask yourself, if you're in doubt and you think anybody could be in jeopardy, um, ask yourself, like, what can I do to help here? What can I do to mitigate any potential harm? Okay. Okay. Again, um, should the pseudonyms for the location be added during the proposal stage? Well, in the proposal stage, you don't, haven't collected data yet, so you don't have any people. So no, not yet in the proposal yeah, stage. Not yet. Okay. But you do say in the proposal that you will use pseudonyms. You state that in the methodology section, but you don't have those pseudonyms yet. Okay. And you can use pseudonyms that are actual names, like you can just pick Emily, Linda, um, Thomas, or you can use numbers, or you can use P1, P2, P3, which stands for participant one, two, three. Some people choose characters out of a book. Some people choose character names out of a movie. You can choose whatever names you want, as long as there is no identifiable trait that you're using. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilber. That's okay. it for now. Okay, great. Thanks, Emily. Thank you. So anticipating the risks and benefits involves a risk benefit analysis to determine whether the benefits of the study outweigh the risks. And remember, that's what you want. You cannot have the risks outweighing the benefits. It has to be the other way around. Despite your best efforts at imagining the likely risks and benefits, no one can really anticipate every possible way that a participant might be affected. Because remember, we don't know what some of our words, the effect of some of our words on people. We don't know that a participant may be offended or very upset about a particular word that we use or a term that we use or the way we look at them. So we, we cannot ever anticipate every possible um, piece of you know, every possible risk. But you have to do it as much as to, the, to the best of your ability. You have to try and work out what could be potentially damaging. Anonymity and confidentiality of participants is preserved by not revealing their identity in the data collection, analysis, and reporting of the study findings. So you never, ever, ever reveal the names of your participants. And usually we keep those names of participants on the transcripts um, in a secure place on our own computers. Um, and we don't, when we, when we share transcripts, even with our advisors or um, with, the mem with member checks, when you go back to participants and ask them, you know, if the transcript is um, authentic, we take all the names off. We sort of take that off. There's nothing else we do to the transcript to clean it up. You cannot go and start cleaning up what I've had some students use that word. I've cleaned the transcripts. That means you've tampered with the transcript and that's not advisable or even acceptable but you should take names out of the out of the transcript and in fact if you even have a participant talking about someone and using their name in the discussion usually we just take out that name and we just put like xxx or something we don't ever reveal anybody's um friends or work associates or anyone in the transcripts that we collect Issues pertaining to privacy and confidentiality must be managed carefully throughout the research process, including all communication, data gathering, um, data analysis, and dissemination of the study's findings, which is in your dissertation. So I'm going to stop again there if there are any questions about risk-benefit analysis. Remember, it's just really weighing up the risks and benefits. Um. 
not at this time for the risk and benefit analysis, okay. but I wouldn't be surprised if something does yep. pop yep. up in no. the next section. No. Absolutely. No problem. I'm going to move forward to, okay. hold on, there were three, what did I miss? There was informed consent, risk benefit, and selection of research participants. Selection of research participants includes issues of justice where questions could arise regarding all choices pertaining to how and in what ways the participants were either included or excluded from the study. Remember, in qualitative research, we select a research sample through purposeful sampling. There's criterion-based sampling, convenience sampling, snowball sampling, and a host of others. And we, as a researcher, choose who will participate in our study because we go out and ask those people specifically, would you participate in my study? And we also choose who not to include in our study. So who do we include and who do we exclude and why? And this is another point of reflection. And I'm going to talk about reflection in greater detail further on because reflexivity, which is a term used for self-reflection, is a very, very important part of conducting ethical and rigorous qualitative research. As a researcher, we are continually reflecting on our practice and continually reflecting on how ethical we are conduct, how, how, to what extent we're conducting ethical research. So your selection criteria for selecting your research sample and your rationale for choosing these criteria must be very transparently declared and explained in your dissertation. Again, this is another way to avoid the black box approach where you're just like saying, I selected um, participants by using certain criteria, that's not good enough. You have to state exactly what your criteria were. Either the criteria are they must be teachers, they must have worked in the same school for three years, they um, must have participated in mentoring program, uh, they must be of a certain um, age. Any criteria that are important to your study, not just a host of criteria for the sake of it, but the criteria that will make a difference in terms of who you want to include in your research sample. So I'll just stop for one more moment um, before we talk about expedited reviews and the common rule. Yes, um, someone's mentioning. So therefore, it is best not to record real names at any time then. Well, if you do record real net, well, mm. record by mean audio record. I do believe that's what it means. Um, well, well, when we're audio recording um, an interview or a focus group, for instance, we have to record exactly what is said. So if you have someone who talks about their principal and they mention their principal's name, there's nothing we can do about that. But when you're creating your transcript, which is a verbatim transcript, word for word, you will just take out the name of other people so that you protect people's identity. Because if you're working, for instance, in a school, if you're doing your research in a school or an organization and somebody mentions a colleague or a work peer or a, somebody else's name, someone on the staff, you don't want those people to be incriminated in any way. So we never, ever use anybody's, anybody's name. And we also don't use the research participants' real names. We're trying to, as you can see, the point is to be very, very clear that no one is identified. And that doesn't, that doesn't take away from the research. That's not going to affect the research. The research can still be very strong and authentic with a pseudonym. Um, people's real names don't have to appear and they, and they cannot appear. So it's not even, a, it's not even up for consideration. Uh, so when you're, sorry, when, I just want to say that when you're applying for IRB, you have to be very, very clear because IRB is going to ask. Are you protecting people's confidentiality? What are you doing with regard to anonymity? So the clearer you are in your proposal about these things, the better chance you have of achieving um, IRB approval sooner rather than later, because they're just going to kick it back and, and ask you to revise. Okay, and, so thank you so much. Um, I don't think there's other questions. Um, at this time, just some conversation in the chat. We can okay, get perfect. to that, but nothing pertaining question-wise, just sharing okay. thoughts and conversation. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, so let's move forward then to the common rule and ex what's called expedited reviews. The three principles of the Belmont Report that were operationalized in 2018 into the common rule governs research at all United States universities. And as I said previously, at all universities, in fact, around the world, everybody um, that does research at an institution of higher education will be governed by the common rule. 
The common rule allows for expedited review of research that involves no more than minimal risk to prospective research participants. Now, most of the studies that we do in a dissertation are expedited because most of our studies will involve no more than just minimal risk. Remember, we cannot ever say there's no risk. There's always minimal risk. But if there's more than minimal risk, then you have to take extra precautions and your research will not be considered expedited. So to be considered expedited is not left up to the researcher. This is where the IRB will make that determination. So the IRB will look at your application and decide whether um, your research involves no more than minimal risk and they'll term your research an expedited application. Let's turn now to what are called vulnerable populations. And this is a really important concept and a really important term to understand when you're doing your research. According to the Belmont report, vulnerability arises from intrinsic attributes or characteristics of the individual or group, which places the individual or group at potential risk of harm or exploitation. Sources of vulnerability include situational considerations, cognitive or communicative vulnerability or impairments, institutional vulnerability due to formal hierarchies or power relationships. For example, in an, in an organization, some people have more power and higher, are in a higher formal hierarchy than other people, and they may have more influence over other people so that the people under them are considered vulnerable. So for example, you would never do research with people that you work with or people that you supervise because that would put them in a vulnerable position of working with you as their supervisor and feeling that they have to answer the way that you would like them to answer. Differential vulnerability is due to informal hierarchies or power, power relationships. There may just be an inform, informal hierarchy in an, in, an inst, in an institution or in an organization where certain people just have more power based on their social standing or their gender or their social class. So we have to be really, really careful that vulnerability can come in many, many, many shapes and forms. There's also medical vulnerability where people with medical conditions may be more vulnerable. Economic vulnerability where people of lower economic or socioeconomic um, standing may be more vulnerable in a, in a situation of research. And then also social vulnerability based on social class or for example, in some countries, there's what's called the CAST system the very clear defined boundaries between certain cases or social classes. Now, the, the groups that are particularly vulnerable, and we make this very, very clear, and that is why um, at any university, it is really not advisable to do research with vulnerable populations because you're going to have a much, much, much harder time of getting your application through IRB, and you're going to have to take many, many, many more precautions because these groups are vulnerable. And what I'm referring to are children, prisoners, individuals with impaired decision-making capacity, and economically or educationally disadvantaged people. These are all considered vulnerable populations, and doing research with these populations is really not advisable. Remember, I want to just make very clear as well, and I see this with my students, you do research with people. We do not do research on people. Doing research on people is a really outdated term. And that's one of the reasons for the Belmont Report, because the Belmont Report came about because there were many experiments, even in our time, even in the early 1900s and 20th century, where various experiments were done on people against their will, without their consent. And these had long lasting, very long lasting ethical and moral implications. Um, for example, people that were incarcerated, research was done on prisoners, people that were held in concentration camps during the Holocaust, uh, people in certain underprivileged communities. Um, that is why the vulnerable, the Belmont Report has come about to protect those vulnerable populations and ensure that never ever again will research be conducted on humans. So we do our research with humans who voluntarily consent to participate in our studies. The three ethical principles described in the Belmont Report, respect for persons, beneficence, and justice, are important to examine in the context of vulnerable individuals and groups specifically because those groups are naturally more vulnerable. So we have to take even greater care when we consider doing any research with a vulnerable population or even one single vulnerable individual. I'm going to stop there again to take questions on vulnerable populations. 
I think I explained it okay. There may not be any questions. No, no, no not at this time. Okay, I think it gives us all oh. something to really, oh, sorry, yeah. Sorry, someone just popped up in the Q&A. How is one to gain knowledge of or data on a vul vulnerable population such as homeless? Well, that is a vulnerable population. And a lot of homeless people are vulnerable simply because they don't have the resources that others may have. They don't have the social resources. They don't, may not have the cognitive resources. They may not have the materials needed to perform adequately in society, and hence they're homeless. So doing research with a vulnerable population like that, similar to prisoners, children, individuals with impaired decision-making capacity, economically or educationally disadvantaged people, you can do research with these populations. And remember, we're not doing it on them, but with them. But IRB application is much, much, much more stringent simply because all these different principles are put in place to protect humans and vulnerable populations are even more at risk. So um, this you can, you can do research with a population that you're interested in, but it's going to take a lot more work on your part. And by the work on your part, you're also meaning in terms of the time that it will take to complete your doctorate, right? Well, is that simply because the IRB is going to take a lot longer okay. and they may even reject it. They may think that the study is not worth the risk. They may see that the, the risks outweigh the benefits. And that goes back to the cost benefit analysis, the, co the risk benefit analysis, cost analysis. Always have to ask, do the risks outweigh the benefits? If you do research with a vulnerable population, ask yourself that question right up front. And if you think that that population or even one individual could be at risk, then, um, then you have what's called really an ethical dilemma. And it, it could take a lot longer to reconcile. And this is just a, a I guess, just a, a point of view brought up about doing research with vulnerable populations. This is in the Q&A. My concern is not doing research with the, the population itself in the same way as other vulnerable, vulnerable populations, maybe not having the same research could potentially skew perspectives and knowledge gained. Absolutely. Um, that is such an important point. And we're going to be coming to that because oh. someone, um, Ravitch and mittenfeld Nicole, who are actually colleagues of mine in the publishing world, have written on that and it's called defetizing um, and we're going to get to that because it's also about who's included and who's excluded so by excluding certain populations like just say we have a mindset of um, we're not going to do research with any vulnerable populations could really negatively influence those populations because then their voices don't get out so if we for example say I'm interested in the homeless but I'm not going to do research with that population because it's vulnerable that's one way of looking at it. But then on the other side of the flip side of the coin, we can say by not doing research with that population means that their experiences are not made known. Their experiences remain hidden and they are kind of like prejudiced against because they're a vulnerable population. So there are all these kind of questions that like are really complex. Um, it's not just a simple cookie cutter, yes, no, black and white sort of thing. There are many pros and cons to do research and not to do research. Do you see, I hope everybody gets the picture that we don't want to exclude people just because they're vulnerable means they cannot participate in research. That's extremely um, stereotypical if we go with that approach. So it's, it's very, very complex. You know, it's not like a simple answer here. And that's a really important point to consider. Like by excluding the vulnerable populations, we're being exclusive. We're not being inclusive, which goes against the grain. So, yeah, such an important question that really. Absolutely. And someone earlier in terms of vulnerable populations popped in the chat that um, their participants were in a very protected group, maxim maximum security prisoners. Um, they wanted to talk about how school could have potentially supported them more so maybe they wouldn't have chosen a life of crime so that's that's just an interesting tidbit that popped up in the chat a little bit ago uh, regarding vulnerable populations and then here's here's my last question in the q a so we can move on um are there specific are there specific implications when saturation has not been met saturation is a whole other area okay um, and 
it's an important question, but I'm not going to go into saturation now because data saturation occurs during data analysis. It's got nothing to do with data collection, but it does have to do a lot with data analysis. And there are many, many excellent articles and books written on saturation and qualitative research. Um, saturation is not just, I have, I have, um, I've heard from some students that they think that saturation is just when you collect data and you start getting redundant data, then you, then you can stop. That's not what saturation is. So saturation is much more complex than that. And it's about themes and codes and, and all related to qualitative analysis. So please, whoever asked that question, it's a great question. Please read up further on that. There's, or even speak to your chair about that. There's a lot written on that and it's very important. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. We'll okay. pause there on the questions. We'll come Perfect. back to some more. Okay, so I hope that I made clear this whole idea of vulnerable populations. It's a really interesting and very important topic. And, and just to make, just to say, um, NCU, IRB, and many, many IRBs don't encourage research on vulnerable populations simply because of the risks involved and the time that it would take to get full exemption and full, full approval um, and to continue making sure throughout the research process that you are, in fact, protecting those people and managing the risk at all times. It's, it's, it's a lot of work to do, requires a lot of skill. Um, and it's sometimes not very well suited to dissertation research for those purposes. So here are some additional ethical considerations, and this is actually what we were talking about right now um, with regard to vulnerable populations. There are specific ethical considerations with respect to specific and particular vulnerable populations. Concerns from an ethical perspective can include historically marginalized or otherwise underrepresented or underserved groups, or groups that are minoritized or mistreated. Considering group histories and experiences means that sensitive topics could create particular vulnerabilities in groups that are not even officially recognized as vulnerable or marginalized. So that's a really important point that sometimes through the research, we delve into topics um, through group histories and experiences that are not officially considered vulnerable and yet they, po they doing that poses additional risks to people. Um, and this is the quote that I wanted to state from Ravitch and Mittenfeld and Carl, 2020, is that you need to be cautious to avoid, and these are their words, essentializing, stereotyping, or defetizing individuals and groups. And that is really important. We, we cannot in any way um, create stereotypes um, or deficits in individuals and groups through our research. Um, so think about that also when you're considering doing research with a vulnerable population in terms of the risks that are posed and the ongoing damage that could be caused even unintentionally through your research by sharing their experiences. But then again, on the other flip side, as we discussed a few moments ago, by not doing research with certain vulnerable populations, are we being exclusionary? Are we being prejudiced just by not doing research with them? So these are really great debate points for you to consider thinking about. I'm going to move now to the really important area of power and positionality, which is an area that I've done a lot of writing in. And in fact, the fifth edition of my book, which is coming out very soon, has an entire chapter devoted to ethics including power and positionality. And power and positionality is a field that is becoming more and more uh, spotlighted because researchers must be cognizant of all the power dynamics involved and whether they are conducting their research, especially with, and whether they are conducting research ethically, especially with vulnerable populations. And these are some of the questions to ask. Is there a power differential between me and my research participants? In other words, do I have a sense of power over them without even realizing it? or with them not even realizing it? Do they work for me? Are they answerable to me? Do they report to me? Um, am I in a higher social bracket than them that would put them at a disadvantage? In what way do I have power over them? Is the consent process conducive to true voluntariness or voluntary participation? In other words, by signing a consent form, does that mean the people are naturally voluntarily participating or do they feel they have to participate because I'm their boss or because I have uh, some power over them? Are there any excessive motivating factors, including economic issues? In other words, am I enticing people to participate in my research by offering them some economic um, rebate or some, some, something in terms of monetary value? 
Are there any other coercive factors, either blatant or subtle? In other way, in other words, how might I be forcing people to participate, even unintentionally? How might I, by asking people to participate in my study, putting them at a disadvantage and making them feel that they have to participate? Are there any potential problematic communication issues? Am I going to be able to speak freely with my participants? Are they going to be able to speak freely with me in the position that I am having some sort of power over them? And is the recruitment process fair and equitable? In other words, am I recruiting people fairly and equitably to participate in my research? And what undue influence may I be placing on them in that recruitment process? So again, I'm going to stop there because power and positionality, even though I only have one slide on it, is a really important topic. And most qualitative dissertations now require what's called a, posi a positionality statement by the researcher. And this is a, is a paragraph or even a page or two that you can write about your positionality as the researcher and what sort of power and position power issues you may be bringing to the table. Not all chairs require this, and it's not stated specifically in the dissertation template, but if you feel this is something that you would like to explain in your research to make clearer who you are in relation to your research participants, please feel free to suggest, to suggest this to your chair. I am using this a lot with my own students lately. And again, I write about um, positionality statements in my book, my new book, and I have a number of different templates and examples of actual, of actual positionality statements that people have used. And it's really interesting to see how people have explained their positionality. I'm going to stop there again, Emily, if there are any questions, comments, thoughts, reflections, etc. Remember, does it, these don't even have to be questions. If you have a thought, just put it out there. Let us all know what you're thinking. In fact, I'd love to know that. Let's, let's for one, one minute... If no one has to feel they have to do this, but if you have a thought that's just popped into your mind one, while I've been speaking about power and positionality, please just put it out there. I'd love to hear what everybody's thinking. Okay, and we'll see what pops up in the chat for power and positionality. And while folks are are popping that in there, and maybe you'll maybe people may think that I've missed something. I'm very open to hearing if you think anything's been overlooked. Okay. Or if you'd like um, extra information or extra discussion around any one of these points, I'm happy to discuss. Um, while we wait for, um, someone did have a question about um, the vulnerable population piece, but I did ask for further clarification, um, expanding on what the question was in reference to. So I make sure I get that question right. Okay. Um, in the meantime, there was a, a question about wondering when the fifth edition book might become available. Yeah, it's actually in press right now and it should be available in September or October. Um, it will have a 2023 date on it. And at, at the end of this, uh, this presentation, I've actually included a link because the publishers have offered a discount if anybody wants to. Anyone who listens to my webinars can have access to this discount if you want. Okay. I'm, not, I'm not coercing anyone and I'm not <laughs> suggesting you need to buy the book. And the NCU okay. library do carry a copy of the fourth edition and I'm sure that they will have the fifth edition as well. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Bloomberg. Um, power and positionality sound like a great idea and would encourage clear bracketing too, just a thought shared in the chat. Yeah, bracketing is a wonderful term that is used specifically in phenomenology where we bracket our assumptions, we actually put like a bracket around our assumptions and biases. Um, some chairs, and I love this idea, do a bracketing interview um, with their students at the start of the dissertation process, where again, it's similar to a positionality statement, but it's a, like a discussion where the student has a chance to bracket their biases and assumptions and to really sort of reflect on them and see how their biases and assumptions could in any way um, negatively impact the research. Okay, and then just some more on power and positionality. Do power and positionality relate to insider-outsider relationships? Yes, absolutely. It's all about insider-outsider relationships as well, because as the researcher, you are the insider. Some of your participants may be insiders. Some participants could be outsiders. So remember, if someone's an outsider, they're immediately considered like on the fringe of something, and they may be less empowered 
and I haven't used that word yet, but less empowered in the research process. So we want to empower all of our research participants to feel that they are really front and center of the research process and that their experiences count and that their voices count and that anything they say will be um, treated as confidential and also um, authentically represented. Remember, we don't want our research participants to ever walk away from the research and think that the researcher can do what they want with the findings. The findings are the findings. They cannot be manipulated. They cannot be cleaned up. Um, we have to present the findings as our participants have told us. And remember their words, the participants' words are our data in qualitative research. We're not looking for numbers and percentages. We're looking at people's words, which is their experience. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on the research researcher black box? The researcher black box is really just a term that I write about, and I've seen it written about with a few other authors. And it just means lack of transparency. Basically, it's just you don't want there to be like this box or this dark hole where um, you keep information, but you haven't really explained it. So it really just goes against the grain of transparency. If you want your research to be fully transparent and therefore fully credible, which is one of the, the criteria of trustworthiness, there's credibility, confirmability, dependability, and transferability. If you want your research to be credible, which is basically means believable, that your readers will think that the research is trustworthy and can actually hold weight, then you don't want ever to portray that you've used a black box approach, which means that you've hidden things or you haven't been upfront with things or you haven't been fully transparent. You never want that to happen. So you wanna be fully transparent. And that's really what the black box is. It's the opposite of transparency. And um, I do have a couple more things, but I don't know how many more slides we have, Dr. Bloomberg, and there's about seven minutes. So do you- Okay, let me quickly go through what I have, okay. hold on to those, and we'll take okay. all of those at the end. Does that make okay. sense? Yes. Okay, wonderful. I love this discussion, and I'm sorry that we're running out of time, but I know these topics are very important, and they take a lot of thinking. Um, let's look at challenges to research ethics since the pandemic. Digital tools and spaces are a large part of how we do qualitative research and even quantitative now, and it's going to be the way that we conduct research going into the future. With, with significant changes in the ways that research is conducted, there's an urgent need to focus on how to minimize exclusion and carry out ethical research. This includes ensuring access, addressing digital literacy, which means how do people access computers? How can they access the, uh, the, the research? Are they being excluded because they don't have the right hardware or software, et cetera. Sampling strategies, making use of secondary or archival data, and the issues, again, the huge issues of privacy and confidentiality. Since the onset of the pandemic, dissertation students have encountered the hurdle of having to modify or change an existing research design. This has become very common since 2020. And this should not present a problem, and indeed it offers emerging research opportunities as long as students are aware of the limitations, ramifications, and implications of using socially distant methods and tools. So because of social distancing, and it's becoming a little less so now that we've gone back to some form of face-to-face -face contact in many contexts, but we are still conducting a lot of research on, by Zoom, over the phone, uh, through social media, et cetera. So doing it in this virtual way creates its own set of circumstances that needs ethical attention. Um, I'm not saying it's diff it's worse or more difficult, but it's just a different way of approaching ethics that we need to be cognizant and aware of. And again, the central focus of reflexivity that I spoke about already, to ensure rigor and ethics in qualitative research implies ongoing self-reflection on the part of the researcher. Reflexivity is the active ongoing process of examining oneself as a researcher and remaining aware of how one's assumptions, biases, and preconceptions affect our research decisions. Reflexivity prepares researchers for many ethically important moments that will emerge as they plan for, conduct, and finally write up a study. And as I said right at the very, very beginning of this webinar, we cannot ever imagine or expect what ethically important moments can occur. Often we can only speculate at the beginning and a lot of these are unanticipated or unexpected. So we have to be willing to be open-minded throughout the entire research process, which is um, formulating our problem, purpose and research questions, selecting our sample, uh, designing our research, our data gathering tools, our data gathering methods, applying these methods, 
Um, what kind of analysis are we going to use? What theoretical or conceptual framework are we going to use? How are we going to present our findings so that our findings are actually um, authentic and that we represent the research participants in the, in the most authentic and um, credible way? So all of these different things, will these different points will arise throughout the research process. And the researcher just has to be willing to deal with and address and acknowledge any ethically important moments that arise. So please proceed with caution. Abiding by the standards of the Belmont Report and the university's IRB regulations will enable you to proceed cautiously and ethically with all your decisions. And conducting ethical research implies protecting and respecting research participants, honoring trust, and remaining sensitive, sensitive to the possible consequences of the work that you do to guard against any harmful effects, both short-term and long-term. And as I said, with individuals, with communities, and even with entire societies. These are the references that I was referring to, which this entire webinar is drawn out of my book. Um, this is the, th the fourth edition and the new fifth edition, and it'll be included in this, um, in this PowerPoint, which Emily is gonna share with everybody. I have a place here for questions and, um, and, and insights, which we're gonna stop for in one moment. And right at the end, I do have the final of the fourth, the final of the four webinars that I did on this rigorous qualitative research series, which is called Reviewing the Qualitative Researcher's Role, Power and Positionality, where we're gonna go into much more depth about power and positionality. I just really touched on it here today. These were the previous three webinars, um, June 6, June 6, July 13, and, and today's August 1st, all of which are going to be housed in the CTL for future reference. And you can always contact Emily or any of the CTL people to help you access these if you're not able to. And I'd love to see many of you in the August 30th, which is the final one, which is going to be a really interesting discussion. And we're going to talk about positionality statements and all things to do with positionality and power. So I'm going to stop now for those questions or thoughts or reflections that could have come across Emily's desk in the last few moments. Absolutely. And there has been. So let me start with the very first one here. Um, what type of incentive is recommended to give to participants? You do not always have to give an incentive. Um, some people will give a free lunch. Some people will give a gift card. Remember, you don't want to ever have your participants feel that you're paying them off or buying them. Mm -hmm. um, so very often you don't even need an incentive. Just asking people, people to participate and telling them that their voice and their experience is so valuable and that sharing it will help others, will help better understand a phenomenon. That's really often very okay with research participants. Um, if you're having a hard, I, I, sorry, let me say this. If, if people are having a hard time recruiting participants, that's when I see the incentives being used because it's just like an additional layer of trying to get people to volunteer, but I'm not a big fan of, of incentives. Okay, thank you so much for your thoughts on that. I do have another question about um, if credibility can be maintained, is there a way in which transparency is not valued in order to expose data that otherwise would not be known? I'm not really sure how to answer that. I'm not really, really okay. sure on that question. If the person who asked that just wants to rewrite it, um, I'm happy to answer it, but credibility and transparency kind of go together. Um, and all research should be credible and transparent. So I'm not really sure how to answer that question. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes. Again, the the issue is um, under homelessness. So that's that's one of the um, Stephen's interests. You know, Stephen, if you do want to expand on it, I'm happy to have you email me and then I can send it to Dr. Bloomberg and we can yeah. try to yeah. I'm happy go to. that way. Yeah. Um, another question here I have, how long, uh, must one save the data after one has completed the dissertation process? It's generally three years, I believe. And that's in the CITI training as well. Um, three years. Um, but yeah. again, just check with IRB. Some IRBs may have different rules. Okay. Um, but it's definitely, you have to hold the data in a very secure place for a number of years in case there are any questions about your research. And after that, you can destroy it. Okay, wonderful. And um, several people just said thank you again so much uh, for 
this webinar. And, uh, you know, folks, we do have the one coming up August 30th, but I will go ahead and just to all the people who are here on this webinar, don't hesitate to reach out. You can always email me at espranger at ncu.edu or contact the CTL. I also see all of those emails in that inbox as well. Um, I'm happy to provide you with these webinars um, separately as, um, if you'd like them, um, but I will include them as a link when I am, am done processing this video sometime tomorrow. So uh, I, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Bloomberg. Thank you so much for coming and presenting here through the Center for Teaching and Learning. And I'd like to thank our attendees as well, because we appreciate all of your questions that helps guide us to know how to better serve you. Um, as staff and faculty. So we appreciate that as well. Dr. Bloomberg, anything else in closing? No, I just want to thank you, Emily, always for hosting these and for being such a great moderator and question collector. And I also want to thank all of our participants, many of whom I know are, are repeat participants. I really appreciate your interest in these topics. I'm happy to discuss them at any point. This is really what I'm passionate about. And um, Again, thank you for your time this evening um, out of, that you took out of your busy days to attend this, and I hope it was valuable to you. Absolutely. And Dr. Bloomberg, on that note, for all of our staff, students, or faculty that are joining, there is a survey at the end of attending this webinar, letting us know what kind of webinars you'd like to see in the future, and we're always keeping our eye on that as well, too. So don't hesitate to participate in that. Until we see you the next time, August 30th, or one of the other webinars for the CTL this month. I hope you all have a great rest yeah. of your and day. And just one quick thing. The one on August 30th is an hour later than tonight's, which is at 6 p.m. Eastern. Um, that is that correct. One. So just so you guys know that everyone knows um, if you're intending to participate, it's going to be at 6 p.m. Eastern on August 30th. Correct. Thank you so much, Dr. Bloomberg. And I hope you all have a good rest of your evening. Thanks, Take everyone. Care. Thanks, Emily. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.